Hello, everyone. I'm going to assume um, that you can hear me. I want, first of all, to apologize for not being there. I uh, did about five hours worth of shuttle uh, riding yesterday, um, trying to get to the airport, which is about two hours from where I live um, and back. When I got to the airport, I found out my flight had been canceled in Springfield because of uh, weather in Denver and it didn't look any better this morning and there was no other way for me to get there in time. So I'm hoping uh, that this um, uh, is some kind of a substitute. I'm here for you to um, lend whatever I've learned in the last 40 years in this field um, to helping uh, especially the organic movement grow and uh, get stronger. I'm a, a early adopter and deep believer. I'm also deeply grateful for the, um, the scholarship grant that we got. We're um, primarily an education organization and um, frankly, I'd say, you know, 30 to 50% of the students that come to our schools um, have no money. <laughs> That's just, we call them the young believers. This is the new young generation that I think is going to live on a different planet than the one I grew up on, and they take it very seriously about sustainability and learning how to take care of themselves. And they've dedicated themselves to that instead of their own economic well-being, especially at a young age. And I think that's appropriate, but we want them at our schools. We find that they're some of the best students that we have. And so thank you for helping with that process. What I thought I'd do today is give you a little bit of background in um, First of all, why I got involved in all of this 40 years ago, I ran my own um, small seed company for 28 years. I'm a small business, private enterprise guy. I'm going to say some things that, uh, against big uh, monopoly business, but I want you to know that, uh, you know, out of my heart, I'm a small business guy. I think that's why I was so successful at Native Seed Search because it was pretty obvious that it just needed some upgrades, you know, around basic business concepts. And so I was able to bring that there. So, um, and then I'm going to go into what I think um, you guys should understand about my world and what's going on, both on a global level and on a uh, local level. So what I'm going to do is share my screen now. I've got a bit of a PowerPoint here. I think I can show you. And, um, if um, this isn't working for you, maybe have somebody step up um, to the computer and, and communicate with me and let me know if things aren't going going well. So I can't see you, so I'm assuming I'm in front of a, a room full of happy, happy people. So, I, you know, for some reason this morning I thought I'd start at the very beginning. And I think we as modern creatures and farmers and people involved in the food system tend to forget this a little bit. We've been so bounded by this abundance that uh, has been delivered to us through our grocery stores and our systems, we forget actually where our food came from. And I just wanted to remind everyone that our food originally came from wild plants. Almost everything we eat, and from the plant world anyway, you know, started out as a wild plant. And most of it was uh, unrecognizable to us now and inedible or unharvestable as this is. This is a picture of uh, einkorn wheat in Eastern Turkey. Einkorn is the first wheat. It's basically just a wild grass. And over a 10,000 year period, people saved enough of the seeds and saved the seeds from the things that were working better for them, enough to turn it into, you know, humanity's, um, one of humanity's great staple crops. And so um, I'm going to take you through a couple of other crops just to um, quickly to remind us. Let me see if I can get my uh, screen to, there it is. Um, so. We also know now because of uh, Nikolai Babilov, a great botan botanist from Russia around the turn of the century, of uh, where these wild plants came from. And thus, most of the native diversity that supports our food system. And those are the Babilov centers, those red centers on there. And if you want you know, to dig into this deeply, if you're a bit of a historian or like to go to the roots of things, there's a great book by Dr. Gary Nabhan, who was one of the co-founders of Native Seed Search. And it's called Where Our Food Comes From. And I just want you to look there for a second. I covered it up a little bit, but um, I, there is no, um, let me see if I can uh, pull this up here a little bit. Um, if you'll notice, there's no real um, uh, source 
of our modern food supply, original native source in the United States. In some ways, I think we've forgotten this also, that um, diversity is what got me into this field originally, the loss of diversity, as it has many people. Because the strength of any ecosystem is its diversity, especially our agricultural system. And if you look at our natural diversity in the United States, we do not have the native diversity here. And so I just want you to remember that for a second. When I got started basically in the seed diversity movement, I'll call it, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, it were, uh, was really at the fringe of things. And I've been lucky enough to live long enough to see it become somewhat mainstream. This is Dr. Bill Tracy, um, uh, Department of Agronomy, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's one of the first endowed chairs for a public plant breeding a grant that was given by Cliff Foundations. And I thought he summed things up pretty well. You know, we talk about agriculture lasting, you know, about 10,000 years, modern agriculture. At least we have archaeological evidence of that. And, and as Bill says, well, the first 9,850 years of breeding might not have been efficient in modern terms. In other words, it's not as fast. It was highly effective. And I think what he's talking about is the fact that almost all of the foods that we eat today came uh, originally from um, wild plants. And almost all of that breeding work was done before um, there was any um, before we even knew what genetics was. We, we hadn't even heard the word before, say, 1900, and most people not before 1930. And I think that's what he's talking about for the first 9,850 years. Every kind of plant food that you eat was once a wild plant that was inedible, and it got to that edible form because um, somebody grew and saved the seeds the way they did the einkorn that I um, uh, described before. Okay, so I just want to give you some um, quick examples, other examples, just to help remind us. So this is uh, a valley in Afghanistan. This is Carrot Valley. This is where we think carrots came from originally. And the two pictures you see there, the one on the left and the one on the right, are the same exact species. That's Dacus carata. And the only difference between them is somebody who had no idea what genetics were. Save seeds from one they liked a little bit better. It was a little less bitter, a little larger, a little easier to eat. Okay, and with carrots we didn't have a timeline of how this happened and how the different colors came into being. If you'll see, we didn't get orange carrots till the 1600s. And that was done largely by Franciscan monks over a 200 year period, we believe. Just saving seeds from varieties little by little, moving the population towards something that they wanted more. Turns out now we know they wanted orange because they, had, they needed more keratin in their diet and they were drawn to that. Here's a picture of lettuce. On the left is pretty much the same species. We don't know exactly because we don't have fossil records of the flowers, but it's pretty much the same species as our uh, Lactuca sativa our wild prickly lettuce you can find in any alley. And the only difference between that and modern romaine is about 4,000 years of somebody paying attention and saving seeds from ones that were a little bit more edible. And if you look on the right there, you can see um, uh, inscribed in, on an Egyptian tomb, the first known inscriptions that we know are pictures of romaine lettuce. It was basically the ancient Egyptians who did this, who gave us, gifted us, through I don't know how many generations is 4,000 years of seed saving it took to get us lettuce. You know, of course, this one's brought out a lot because most of this breeding was done in Northern Europe, relatively modern era, but one wild mustard, Brassica oleraceae, depending on where it was taken by which sequestered community and what they were looking for became all of those modern crops. And again, all of this breeding took place before the modern era. 
Chiltepines is the one that I learned about when I was at Native Seed Search. Capsicum annulum, it's a perennial plant, an understory shrub that grows in southern Arizona, northern Mexico, that's where it's native. And out of that, Dr. Gary Nabin, you know, estimates that it was less than 400 years worth of saving seeds in different areas, and especially after the Columbian Exchange, and, and these pepper seeds were taken back to the New World, all the different sizes and shapes and heats of modern you know, peppers that we call them uh, were created. And again, all of this was done before we knew really what modern breeding techniques. And then probably the grandmother of them all is Teosinte, um, tropical grass, first known archeological um, evidence uh, outside Oaxaca 8,700 years ago. Um, you can see that it produces these little hard seeds. I've got a little bit bigger picture. You know, somebody walked into a field of this grass and, and they uh, shook out some of this stuff, ground it up, made probably the first tortillas or ash cakes and made a decision to stop being just hunter gatherers. Let's be village people. We can base enough food out of here now. We'll still hunt and gather, but this is really where agriculture started in the new world. We've got uh, archaeological evidence, you know, fossilized evidence of how little by little, saving seeds from this one plant, we made it bigger and changed its characteristics until it became what we know as modern corn. One of the surprising things I learned at, uh, in Tucson when I was at Native Seed Search is that the oldest evidence of agriculture in the United States, in what is now the United States, is a 4,000 year old um, dig just north of Tucson in Marana, Arizona. And in that dig, they found this, chapalote. It took about, so in other words, it took about 4,700 years of seed saving and seed saving a little bit further north in a shorter growing season and finding something that finally made it and then moving it a little bit farther north and everything dying probably and then maybe one plant made it and they saved those seeds and they planted them a little farther north and they finally moved it up to the southern border of the United States after 4,700 years. But look at how well developed it is. That's Chapalote from today, and I think, you know, if you think we need modern breeding to have beautiful straight road corn, then you just don't understand the history of corn. And then, it, you know, it went all over North America. Um, by 1840, there were 500 commercial varieties being counted, and by 1920, over 1,000 commercial varieties, each and every watershed, ecological, and or cultural niche in the United States had its own variety of corn, one that was adapted to the area where it was grown so that it could produce what people wanted with the fewer inputs probably. And again, all this happened before the modern era. And just to show you how you know malleable this whole system is, you know, those are the county extension agents in Anchorage, Alaska. And they started about 25 years ago trying to get corn to grow in Alaska. And they got all the earliest varieties they could. And they, they, did, they, they just continued the same um, ritual, I'll call it of saving seeds from things that work where you are. And they finally, there it is, sweet corn in Anchorage, Alaska, a tropical grass moved all the way north. So where are we today? And this is why I got involved in this in 1979. Um, there are lots of estimates about how much diversity we have lost in our modern agriculture. Because we focused on yield, nothing wrong with that. Because we focused on making things bigger, nothing inherently wrong with that because you know that's how you make more profit. But because we focused exclusively on that, we woke up in the late 70s, early 80s, and especially the 90s and realized that all that diversity that it took 10,000 years in every little eco niche of the world and for all the different kinds of wild foods we have, 90% of that wasn't around anymore. And this is a, uh, was a, a worldwide study done by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. But it just makes sense. Walk out into your own fields. Remember what your grandparents grew. Remember what was even grown a generation ago and look around and see if we are growing even a fraction of the kinds of varieties of things that we used to grow wherever we are. And a lot of that was then fueled by the centralization of the seed industry. And I, maybe you've seen this chart, some part of it. If not, there's an updated version. You can find it on the internet, Michigan State University. But um, those are the red circles are chemical companies. 
The blue ones are traditional seed companies. And that's all the mergers and acquisitions that took place between 1996 and 2013. We've taken what is maybe 20,000 small um, businesses around the world and we've centralized them into a handful of what are now being known as the gene giants. And this, this merger and acquisition is still continuing. Last year, um, six of the biggest companies merged even further. Monsanto is now Bayer, uh, Dow, and DuPont merged, and they spun off a new company called Corteva. And Syngenta, which owned at the time about 80% of the vegetable seed being grown in the United States, um, is now owned by ChemChina. So this is bookmark this idea because I'm going to come back to it a little bit. But all this centralization and monopolization has resulted in the loss of a huge amount of diversity. And, you know, it didn't take scientists um, very long to tell, you know, people in our government and governments all over the world that this is not a good idea. That with um, changes in climate, and now we're experiencing that even more, um, we're, you know, diversity is really our only hedge that when um, we have really hot or dry weather, it's not gonna be the mainstream varieties that give us the most yield that will, that will survive. It's gonna be fringe varieties, you know? And we don't even know the names of those varieties yet. And as the disease vectors start to rise, as we get rains at the wrong time or get droughts at the wrong time, I mean, it's really diversity that um, is going to uh, be called forth to find the kinds of resistances to, to especially pests and diseases, but also adaptation to water and to drought and to heat and to cold, that it's going to allow any agriculture to survive what we're facing. And so in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, uh, the world sort of collectively were, woke up to this and they said, wow, we better, good idea, we better save all the seeds to everything that we've got right now before more of it disappears. And so what you're seeing is a picture of where after uh, 40 years where all those seeds went. Those uh, lines are uh, uh, seed banks that hold more than 10,000 accessions, each of them, around the world. And the big ones are actually what we call the CGARs, gene banks the yellow ones. And those were uh, a system that was created partially by the Rocker, Rockefeller Foundation, the United Nations, to find central places um, to uh, act as sort of the um, uh, governing repositories of these things. And then the green ones are national seed banks. And the red dot there is Svalbard, the, uh, uh, which was not meant to be another gene bank and just, you know, uh, find and save the seeds but to be a safety backup seed bank for all those other seed banks. And so this is a pretty rational system. And this is the modern system that we've, uh, that we've developed. There's a picture of Svalbard. Most people didn't even know that we had seed banks until they saw pictures or heard about this. And they call it the doomsday because it's just in case. And there's a significant difference between Svalbard and those other seed banks. Those other seed banks took on the responsibility of keeping those seeds alive. First, they store them, but seeds don't live. After 20, 30, 40, 50 years, those seeds are starting to die. And we need to bring them back out again. And the millions of accessions in those seed banks need to be regrown. So I know this because I was the director of Native Seed Search, which is one of these seed banks. And we had about 2,000 varieties of uh, native seeds from the Southwest that had been collected over a 40 year period. And it was our job to keep them alive. And as they start to die, if you wanna be a, a, a cautionary scientist, you, you'd grow them out every 10 or 20 years. And when I got to native seed search, it turns out number one, the foundations that had paid to grow the seeds for native seed search on their 60 acre farm in the past, no longer wanted to pay for them. They'd already done that once. It just wasn't, they go, you know, do you expect us just to pay for this for the rest of you know your your existence you guys got to come up with another model about that we're just not going to pay for it and the other thing is costs have gone up i figured it was going to cost about 13 million dollars to grow out the native seed search collection over the next 10 years and frankly for a small nonprofit in the southwest that just wasn't going to be viable and so i the story of how i got here and maybe why i'm talking to you guys i was i was um recruited to start a new seed conservation organization 
like native seed search for the Rocky Mountain West. We want us native seeds for the Rocky Mountain West. That's what a funder said to me. And I was a little bit leery going, you know, it's just not going to work the way native seeds in the past. Um, if you'll let me try a new idea, if you'll let us turn the idea of seed conservation back on its head a little bit and support us on that, um, I, I, I'll do that. And that was five years ago. So basically what we did, was it's a really simple idea. And this is the idea I want to give to you guys today. I want you to think about this deeply. Um, you're going to need diversity in the organic seed movement. We're all going to need diversity wherever we are. I think that that diversity holds the key to your financial success because it allows you to differentiate products in your marketplace. It's the Walla Walla sweet or Vidalia sweet onion idea. If you have a variety that's yours in your area of the world that only you can grow as best and you have the seeds for it, and you have the story from whatever grandmother or native tribe that you got them from, that's your product. And once that, if that's really great product and you market that, nobody can compete with you. You're out of the commodity market. And so I think in the end, that holds a lot of promise. And so what we decided to do was instead of saving the seeds in the Southwest or the Rocky Mountain West, the ones we have, we would use all of our energy to teach everybody that we could find that wanted to learn how to save their own seeds and try to re-engender a community sense of seed stewardship the way it was two generations ago. The beauty in this vision is that we don't have to make it up. We just have to go back a couple of generations because this is what we had all over the United States. In fact, one could argue that early work in the late 1890s through the 1930s by the USDA was to set up this system exactly. And so now at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance within five years, what you're looking at is a directory. You can go to our website, RockyMountainSeeds.org, and you can click on any one of those people. And those are seed stewards. Those are people who have come to our site, signed up, and promised to grow and save and share the seeds to something really special. And you can get the seeds from them. You can communicate with them directly. Their emails are on there. And so what, every time I pull up this directory and look, it's growing. I'm just a small nonprofit with four part-time people. I don't have time or energy to um, take care of a seed bank, to grow out seeds, or to even manage a large organization. But now we have software just in time to, that allows us to do this. This is software that was developed for the Howard Dean campaign, um, which was the first grassroots political campaign. And they made it an open source. It's called Civi CRM, if anybody's interested. And so that's what we're doing. Instead of spending 95% of the budget and the energy of an organization the way I did at Native Seed Search on just keeping the organization afloat and trying to grow out seeds, we're spending about 80% of the energy in this organization to teach people how to grow and save their own seeds. We're teaching people how to teach people how to grow and save their own seeds so that we can get up and running in our region and it's important that it's our region because we can share seeds easily to the other people in our region because they work there. So instead of um, uh, uh, seed banks now, we promote uh, backup seed vaults. And instead of the whole world sending them to one backup seed vault the way they do at Svalbard, I'm doing what Andrew Mushita from Zimbabwe taught me. He said, they'll never store your seeds any further than you can go check on them. So these are plants we had drawn up. These are off-the-shelf septic tank parts. And then you just uh, bulldoze some dirt over the top. And you can make it as fancy as you want or whatever. But, uh, and you're free, uh, the, these plants are free. We'll share these with anyone who wants to get one started. We do have, in the Southwest now, two additional safety backup um, seed vaults. They were, uh, one is under, both of them are underground, actually. They weren't done using these plants. But this idea is starting to spread. And then you might ask, well, if we've got community um, safety seed backup, who's going to actually grow and save the seeds? Well, as you saw in our directory, it's the seed stewards. And I just want to show you, you know, in the United States, we, we think we're so far ahead in everything, in tech and, and innovation or whatever. In Greece now, Arch Noah, which is a seed saving organization, has 8,000 members. Once a year, they have a big festival where everybody comes together, they have good food and music, and they have computers. And what they do is everybody brings back the seeds that they're taking care of for their national seed bank, in a sense. 
their community seed bank. And they uh, quickly crunch numbers before everyone goes home and they send back seeds with people for varieties that need to be regrown out. And so this is a completely grassroots, community-driven seed bank. And now they're caring for more seeds than the Greek National Seed Bank. And these guys don't really have a budget. They're just raising the money themselves to do this. This is citizen science. This is people realizing that they've got to uh, take things into their own hands, or they want to. They want to go back and get closer to their food and those varieties that mean something to them, the stories. And you know, our, our sort of our version of that in the United States so far have been the seed library movement. I don't know if you're aware of that because these are small gardeners and they're passing around seeds that haven't been, you know, to be honest, they haven't been um, grown out in long enough lines and, and um, seen if they breed true enough to be used in larger scale market or industrial agriculture. But that's not their job. Their job is to find diversity and to do testing in backyards. Something they can do even if they have garbage and it grows up or they make genetic mistakes. Backyard gardeners, I think this was one of the th most important things I've learned on this journey, is back, what's the worst thing that can happen? If somebody who has no idea how to save seeds starts to save seeds in their own backyard and they make a horrible genetic mistake, the worst thing that happens usually is that they still get to eat it you know they're still gardening there's nothing to lose it's all upside and it's been the small farmers and the gardeners that have always created the diversity that we need in that 10,000 year journey i think people that didn't have a larger stake in making sure that their crop was all uh, uniform or that it all um, got ripe on the same day. Those are values they need. Those are values you need modern plant breeding in universities and corporations to do. But to create diversity, you can do it in backyards. And that's what seed libraries are springing up to help facilitate. If you don't know a seed library is a place you can go in and check out seeds for free. And if and when you can, you learn how to grow, save some seeds, and you check them back in. Uh, twice as much if you can. And in that way, the community resource grows. And in the United States, if you go to seedlibraries.net, you can see the list. There's over 400 self-organized community seed library organizations in the United States now, 600 worldwide. And you can uh, sign up for the Cool Beans newsletter and you can figure out what's going on. And these are starting to become the repositories of, community, of uh, genetic diversity in our communities again. And what's happening then is market farmers are going down to the library and they're hearing about a really great variety and they're bringing some of that home and it needs work. And now we have organizations like the Organic Seed Alliance, which teaches farmer breeder training and how to, how to actually improve those varieties so that you could use them on your market farm. And so all of these pieces in organizations that I've seen grow up in the last you know, 40 to 25 years, and now 10 years with the seed libraries, are all starting to come together and give me real hope that we're gonna figure this out. Do you realize that the largest community seed bank in the United States is a high school in Maine? And they've been doing this for 25 years. And when you're a freshman, you learn how to garden and you learn how to save seeds and you work your way through the program that by the time you're a senior, you're one of the directors of the seed bank. And they send seeds out to people who request them all over the world. I mean, if you think about it, if we organized ourselves, every high school could be a seed bank. And of course, this is happening all over the world. Um, in space, we are way behind and learning all of the innovative and creative ways that communities all over the world are coming around, taking back their stories, taking back their seeds, realizing that things that are adapted to their soil and their conditions, and with them saving it, can change and readapt, that that's the most valuable thing. And so they're starting to celebrate it. And in fact, then there's even a higher level Instead of just having one safety backup, say, for a whole community for its seeds, what they're doing in South Africa now is Andrew Mushita has helped organize 17 countries, um, smallholder farmers in 17 countries, to do redundant backup between their safety backup seed banks. So the idea was to build three of these things. Everybody close to that would put their seeds in there. Then a complete backup copy of that would be taken to the other two so that no matter what happens, those people aren't going to lose their seeds. 
And then one of the most sophisticated things I've seen, and I'm trying to introduce you to some of the stuff I've learned overseas because I think they're just ahead of us. Pro Species Rara is an organization, it's about a 40 year old seed saving organization in Switzerland. The little uh, dots on their directory are, are uh, community gardens where they organize their seed stewards and these are all citizen volunteers to grow out in systematic trials the seeds of the rare and disappearing varieties that they found and brought back. And they do this um, for the public. This raises awareness, everybody gets to see them. And what's happened then is commercial seed growers have been walking through here, or farmers, and they're going, wow, I would really like to have that be. Or I think that's an incredible thing. Yeah, where do I get the seeds to that? And so what they've done on their uh, website here, and unfortunately it's not in English at all, but um, they set it up a seed catalog. And it's just like ordering seeds online in the United States. And you find any of the 4,000 varieties of disappearing and heirloom and heritage um, varieties of things that they found. If you like it and want to order it, you can click an order. And instead of sending you to a commercial seed company, it first sends you to one of their seed stores directly. And you communicate with them and they've worked out some, some things so that you can get the seeds from the seed stewards in their network. If those seeds aren't available or if they become available through a commercial entity, you can click and buy them from a commercial seed house. And if I remember correctly, about 48 varieties now, and this is relatively new, have come out of their trials and are now commercially available varieties. And they've signed an agreement with a commercial company so that if they use one of these varieties that was found, increased, stewarded, and grown out in these systematic trials by a nonprofit organization, that if they use that commercial variety, use that variety commercially, they will then kick back a small percentage as a donation to the nonprofit. So now we've got, and this is what I think about it as a businessman, uh, a commercially viable way of uh, supporting a nonprofit in the long run, a citizen science run nonprofit in the long run to take care of the most basic thing, the diversity of the region. Something that will never pay well enough on its own in the short term, you know, that will always need some sort of help. So, wake up to the world. I was um, lucky enough to go to Rome uh, in November for uh, a meeting, a uh, United Nations meeting for plant genetic resources. And I got to see 140 countries of the world sit down in one, one room at the FAO headquarters in Rome and try to hammer out some agreements in a treaty that they've all signed so that all of us, especially in the North, and you saw the United States without any of its own diversity, so that us in the North could have access to the world's diversity in all, first through all of this, the uh, Seagar seed bags and then through all of the national seed banks that are all over the world. And uh, frankly, the treaty is about to break down. That was the real wake up call for me. And there are uh, calls from the smallholder farmers around the world who are saying, hey, wait a minute, you guys have been coming in here since the 1900s and taking seeds and plants from us, and you've built billion dollar industries out of them, both seed and then in, in pharmaceuticals. And uh, we don't have anything from that. And these things came from our areas, and we're the ones that grew and saved these seeds. We're the ones that probably brought these from being wild plants. And so the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture was signed because people thought that there would be some form of benefit sharing, that, that in, in trade for access to the world's genetic resources, especially among the wealthy countries of the North, um, there would be some percentage of benefit sharing that would go back to the smallholder farmers that actually grow and take care of all these resources and keep them alive and keep them readapted. And um, that's breaking down. Um, we, our country is one of those that says no, you know, and we, we've had a chance to voluntarily give back and we just haven't. And so because of this, this uh, chance, this uh, discussion now that's happening on, in several treaties about amending rules 
around this so that you can't just go into a country and take things out anymore. Um, this was in Science Magazine this past summer. This is how they reacted, that, the, that these new kinds of rules would smother research. And what they're talking about is that we would lose ready, um, legal, and open access to the 64 crops that are in the treaty already and would lose any chance of having access to the other crops that we so dearly want access to. So here's the treaty. I was uh, with a number of people there we were talking about just how um, we could resolve this issue. And frankly, it's very complicated, but this is what I want you to know is that we can, as um, farmers in this country and as organic farmers in this country, we can go down this road and pretend that all of the seeds in the seed banks are okay. We've got enough diversity and that we can allow um, all of the forces that we've set in motion to continue, worm monopolization, worm privatization of the seeds, um, and, and believe that everything's gonna be okay. And I firmly believe that um, the, the biology uh, of what's going on around us, especially with climate change, will keep that from happening. So if, if you wanna look up more about the international treaty, I'm not gonna go into that deeply, but the treaty itself was supposed to, it does um, recognize the enormous contribution of farmers. Um, it wants to establish access to plant genetic materials for the world scientists, but it also wants benefit sharing. And until we start to think about that and to talk about that in our country and what's going on, then, um, then we, you know, if we face the realistic possibility that um, the same kind of balkanization that's happening in world trade that we saw maybe with Brexit starting to happen in some of our own treaties, that's going to start affecting our access to plant varieties that could be resistant to diseases, especially that we're going to see. So I just want to bring it back and I'm going to end with short discussion about this because as organic um, uh, growers, we need to understand this in this country because I find that a lot of organic growers haven't really heard or they've heard about it, but they haven't really dived in or understand it. So I'm just going to give you about a three or four minute uh, little summary. I hope that's all it takes here. So utility patents are regular patents. These are the patents that are allowed on um, new machines, new kind of wrench, a new kind of software. Um, and it's starting in 1980 because of a Supreme Court decision, um, Checker Barty uh, decision, um, uh, plants were allowed to be patented. And it was a kind of a highly controversial, still is a highly controversial thing. It is the most restrictive intellectual property on plants globally. It um, started here in the United States. It's been copied in other countries. And it's really one of the things that the international treaty has had to try to deal with because it's it's hard to argue um, uh, about benefit sharing and about access to materials if somebody's going to come in and patent them. I mean, it's just causing all sorts of discussions. So um, when a seed is utility patented, it can only be used for crop production. It can be used for seed saving, replanting, resale, giving away, or use in any breeding program. And what's different than, about this than, than uh, plant variety protection up to this point was that um, the PVP system that the USDA set up to give incentive and to allow companies a head start when they created new varieties. I'm a private enterprise guy, and this is important sometimes so that people get paid back their investments, that there's incentive to do investing in good plant breeding. That system, the PVP system, was different in two ways. It allowed for farmer safe seed. There was a farmer's exemption. And for breeding safe seed. In other words, breeding programs could go on with their seeds. And those are two very important things that have always been allowed to farmers. Farmers have always had the right to save their own seeds. How else are you going to keep a crop in front of the climate change that you are facing? We've always done that by just saving seeds from the plants that work best in our fields. And if we can't do that anymore, then all that evolutionary breeding for 10,000 years stops. And all the seed saving, all the community seed saving, everything stops. And that's why as an organization, the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is involved. And why I'm bringing this up to you is that we are seeing an unprecedented, in my lifetime, 
uh, infiltration of utility patented seeds into certified organic seed catalogs. They're primarily being um, funneled from three companies on the top from Europe, Vitalis, Bejo, and Genesis. And they're showing up in the, uh, the largest seed catalogs in the United States that sell the market farmers, especially, and sell certified organic seeds. And so you can find utility patented certified organic seeds in all of those catalogs. And so I tried, I wrote to all of the catalogs, asked for lists, no one will give us lists. Breeders like Frank Morton, Wild Garden Seed in Oregon is starting to, you can't figure out, it takes a lot of research and some guesswork to figure out what is actually patented and not because the catalogs aren't being really good at even marketing, marking those things yet. So I did, I spent, I don't know how many hours doing some research in the 2019 Johnny's catalog. And what I found out was that 32 out of 79 of the lettuce varieties in that catalog were utility patented now. That was up from 28% the year before. So what does that mean to me as a seed saver and as an organization? Lettuce is an open pollinated seed. It's not hybrid. When we teach basic seed saving classes, this is what we teach people to save. And we love for our, everybody in our organization to buy certified organic seed. And they're buying open pollinated. For us, that's been a green light. That's the best of all worlds. And now, their utility patented means no seed saving. You're not even supposed to allow the seed to go to the plant to go to seed. Here's an example out of the Johnny's off their uh, off their website, just to give you an example. And as I said, um, what I found were uh, four of the varieties were not even marked in the catalog. Um, no, none of them are marked that I could find in the territorial catalog. Um, the print catalog this year to high mowing seeds um, does have a code for them, but I didn't see it yet on their online version. So we're in a, a, a field of change under these things. And so, you know, in doing some research, I just wanted to point this out to you. You know, people are saying, well, well, you know, it's not a big deal. And I, you know, who's going to know if I have seeds and, and I save some on my own or whatever. But I just want you to understand that this is Vitalis that's on their website under no circumstances. Shall any harvestable material in any way be used for multiplication or reproduction, all right? No seed saving. One of the companies that's a, uh, uh, a front-end retail website for, uh, I believe it's Genesis Seeds, said something interesting when I was looking. It said, violation of our supplier's intellectual property rights may constitute a serious offense. For further info, see AIBseeds.com. And I'm going, what is AIB Seed? So I went there, and it is the Anti-Infringement Bureau for Intellectual Property Rights on Plant Material. And you can see that Bejo, Enzozyme, which is the parent company of uh, Vitalis, there's Bear, these are all the big companies. And so they have all formed an Anti-Infringement Bureau to keep people from saving patented material. All right, That's basically what it's for. Production use and trading of illegal products is an important source for financing organized crime. This is their words on the AIB website. Now, I don't know what that means, but I'm a seed saver. Does that mean if I continue the 10,000-year-old tradition of the gifts of somebody else, passing them down and me saving seeds, and then uh, planting them again and giving them to someone else, all of a sudden that's a source for financing for organized crime? I mean, that, that was hard for me. And now there's a national um, a version of uh, this international. It's called SIPA, Seed Innovation and Protection Alliance. I just found this the other day. These are companies coming together to make sure that nobody is saving patented seeds in the United States. There's just some of the, the companies that um, have come together and do it. It's a who's who list of the companies. Enzozyden, again, and Bejo are basically certified organic seeds. They're the ones responsible for the uh, utility patented seeds in our catalogs. And they've got a code of ethics. And what was really interesting to me in this code of ethics is that um, there's nothing in there about um, respect for where the seeds came from originally, or passing them on, or any responsibility for keeping diversity alive, which is really, I think, the foundation of our agriculture. So, you know, if you want to protect your varieties, 
you know, um, use the system that was, uh, the legislation was passed in 1970, the Plant Variety Protection Act. I'm not going to go in there, but if you look at the bottom, there's breeders exemption and farmers exemptions. This allows us to keep the seed saving system alive and going on and creating new varieties and not pigeonholing it. And it protects varieties for up to 20 years from somebody else, you know, saving those seeds and trying to sell them, they can't do it. But they can still save their own seed. A farmer could save his own seed and go on with a great new variety that they find. And I want you to know in Europe what they've done now is they've started, uh, they've got 80 organizations now come together in there, just say no patents on seeds. And they're trying to get um, uh, a movement started in Europe to change uh, EU law um, around this. And here is a, a, you know, a sister organization, I'm sure, to what you're doing. Organic farmers urge the commission to ban patents on seeds. And so I would like to see our American organic organizations do this. I don't think we have to, you know, as I keep saying, I think we can, um, it's okay to protect varieties. We're business people, we need to be able to do that. But when we go over and call our seeds the same as we would do a new invention, just because we found the, uh, the color purple in it, or just because we found heat tolerance and brassicas, and those are two traits now that have been utility patented. This thing's kind of getting out of hand. When that starts to happen, we all lose. And so actually, the sister movement in Europe is to make sure that um, they're actually, uh, after thinking it through, they're going to allow utility patents on plants now. But it's only plants that have been genetically modified, genetically engineered. Those are new inventions. And I think the farming community over there, especially the organic farming communities, decided that um, you know, for all the battles they want to take on, it's worth backing off a little bit on that and say, hey, you know, anything that's produced through traditional breeding techniques, through biological processes, can't have a utility patent on And there seems to be a lot of commonality around that. So I'll just say that that's kind of where this is moving in Europe. So we're, um, we've been given money to form a steering committee for a patent-free seed uh, movement in the United States. We're going to be meeting this summer. Uh, you can reach me at bill at um, rockymountainseeds.org if you want to be involved in that. One of the other things we're big um, proponents of, and we've got stickers, and you can take this idea if you want to further it, but um, these stickers are starting to show up on uh, organic produce. Not only is the produce in your store organically, not only was it grown locally, but it was grown with locally, local seeds, which means they're adapted which means that somebody at the base of the food chain is looking out for taking care of the 10,000 year old diversity treasure that we, uh, that we need to grow back in our backyards. And so this is, you know, this is gonna take a long time for ideas like this to catch on, I realize. But there are people that are starting to, and believe me, the young, the young believers that, I, that are coming to our seed schools um, love this idea. So just before I end, I want to invite you, what we do is education. Our next program is a six-day seed and grain experience at a hot springs um, property in uh, southern Idaho. We've got about three acres of heritage and ancient grains growing there now. We'll be able to um, walk through those. We're going to be doing, we'll show you what we're learning in our trials. We're actually trialing about 300 varieties of grains and 100 sites now in the Rocky Mountain West. Heritage and ancient grains, grains that were largely part of the communities of our region uh, before chemicals and before a lot of the irrigation. And so, wow, isn't that what we're looking for? Organic, adapted to where it lives, and um, uh, grows with less water. These are deep-rooted grains. And so that's what we're trying to do. You'll get to see what we're doing there, and then we'll go through all of the the seed citizen stuff I've um, touched on today, international treaties. Um, and then we'll teach you how to teach about these things so that we can really, you know, recreate a vibrant um, uh, farmer, gardener, seed saver culture the way we used to have in this country. So um, here's a picture of all our grain growers now. I just wanted to show you that here at the end. Um, and here's our trial list. We got about 285 different ancient and uh, heritage grains that we found from around the world. And, and just at the end, I know one of the questions that I've had uh, maybe I can answer it up front, and I know I'm running out of time, but I think this is worth it. 
You know, basically, um, we're a proponent of seed saving, and a lot of that's taken place in backyards, and it's small-scale people. We've got larger market gardeners doing that now, and we do some training around that. But primarily, what we're interested in is diversity, and that can happen on small scales. As I like to say, a woman on um, uh, welfare in a trailer can help us with our grain project by growing one einkorn plant in a pot. Increasing one seed to 500 and sending us some of those seeds back. I mean, everybody can help everywhere. And if we get millions of people saving their own seeds, we'll have enough diversity, I believe, to start to recreate what we had. And maybe that'll get us through. That's my real hope. And so when people say, oh, Bill, it's really kind of a cute idea to have small seed savers, but that's not real. That's not real agriculture. And you know, I get that, but I just want you to understand this. This is from the Canadian Wheat Board website that the first commercial harvest of hard winter wheat in Canada was in 1902. It was grown on the Spring Coulee, Alberta farm of E.E. E. Thompson, who imported a whole carload of turkey red. Originally from Ukraine, this is an old heritage wheat that we're bringing it back to. All right, and Thompson's grain was widely propagated for seed. So he brought one carload, train carload. He went down to the Midwest, found this wheaty light, wheat he liked from Ukrainian immigrants, took one carload up to Canada in 1902 and grew it out. By 1908, there were four million bushels of wheat being grown, largely from that one carload. That's how fast we can scale this up. If I leave you with anything, I want you to remember just how powerful seeds are. Inside each seed is a million more. It's an exponential system. It gives us hope, it helps us build community. It connects us with stories of our past. And this is what we've forgotten as modern farmers. And I believe as organic farmers who want to steward our land and take care of ourselves. This is really something that will give us the edge up as we go forward and be successful. So, so thank you very much for, uh, for allowing me to come and speak. And uh, I hope you'll invite me back sometime. And feel free to go to RockyMountainSeeds.org to uh, uh, sign up for some of our programs or at least get in our email universe. We'll keep you updated on what we're doing. Thank you.